Okay, so guys, today on September 29th, 2018, we are going to be talking um, about different things today. So, let's get on into the video today. Okay, so we're going to watch this video off of YouTube. Um, so, yeah. Um, Just so y'all can see it better. How do you hear God's voice? This was a question that was asked to me during the stream recently, so I'm going to answer it in this video. It is imperative to recognize God's voice. In John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus' followers are identified as those who hear his voice and follow him. So if you want to follow Jesus, you need to recognize his voice. So how do you hear God's voice? God doesn't speak to us in any one specific way. God actually has various ways of speaking to us. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Since God speaks to us in various ways, I'm going to be sharing four ways that God speaks to us today. Four ways that you can hear God's voice. Number one, God speaks to us through his word, the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 states, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Bible is inspired by God and through it he communicates to humanity his character, his love, his will, his truth, and his plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. Number two, God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 13, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through impressions. He also guides our thoughts and brings conviction to our lives regarding the truths of God's word. Number three, God speaks to us through our conscience. You know that feeling of guilt that you get when you do something wrong? That's of God. That's one of the ways that He speaks to us. However, you don't want to completely rely on your conscience for moral guidance in your life. The reason being is because you can silence your conscience if you keep rejecting those feelings of guilt. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2 talks about the possibility of having your conscience seared with a hot iron. That basically means that it becomes dead to continued rejection of guilt. That's why it's important to read the Bible daily to make sure that your life is in line with the principles of God's word. And if it's not, you need to repent from your sins and ask for forgiveness and God will forgive you. You need to train your conscience to the Bible and not the Bible to your conscience. Number four, God speaks to us through other believers. This could be a preacher, friend, teacher, or parent. Yes, even your parents, guys. I know some of you don't want to hear that, but their words may come as guidance, blessings, warnings, or even prophetic truth regarding your life. How to know whether their words are genuine or not depends on whether or not they address a specific issue in your life, line up with God's word, and are fulfilled in your life. If that's the case, that is a confirmation from God that the message spoken to you was His message. Those are four ways that God speaks to us today. There are still some other ways that God can speak to us, like through visions and dreams, but that happens quite infrequently. The four ways that I shared are some of the most common ways God speaks to us to help the average Christian understand how to hear God's voice. Have you heard God's voice? Please share your experience in the comments section. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you're new.
Also, if you want email alerts directly to your email inbox, so if y'all like didn't uploads, know, y'all can watch it. It's sure from Bible Fox. So, so um, on my channel page. Yeah, it's from Bible Fox. So if y'all want to watch it, y'all can feel free to. Um, but I feel like what he said was right, and the Bible isn't really based on feeling; it's based on truth, not feeling. So let's. Watch more. Okay, now we're now if y'all don't like the um King James version of Acts eighteen, then you can do the New International or whatever kind you like. But this one is just gonna do it in. It's just gonna like read it from the King James version, which is. Honestly, one of my favorite kinds of the Bible is the King James Version, but I also have a New International Bible, so... Yeah, there's different ways you can hear it, but we're gonna do the King James, but if you want, you can look up the one from New International Bible. After these things, house. Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit, and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence, and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul, and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. When Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names, and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sencria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Now when they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea, and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Okay, so we're going to stop it right there. Um, but you get the point. Um, I know y'all are probably like, why didn't you choose that? Well, I chose that because I want you to get something out of it. There's a special something I really want you to get out in that verse. And one thing I do want you to get out of that verse, Acts 18, is then Paul, well, no, let me ask this question. Did Aquila ever get mad at Priscilla? No. They stayed respectful to each other. But a lot of things we do in this world is we don't stay respectful when we don't like someone. We we tend to get 
this angry thing in us and we really want to just like fight that person but in the bible jesus never fought anyone so he wants us to not fight anyone he wants us to teach his word to other people it doesn't matter if we hate them it doesn't matter if we love them it doesn't matter how we feel about them he still wants us to teach the bible to that person it doesn't it doesn't mean if you don't like that person, don't preach to them. That's not what it means. And you don't preach at the person. You just... I'm trying to think of how to describe this to y'all. You just, like, talk to them. Have a normal conversation with them. And then you can bring the Bible in your conversation with them. And... That's what he wants us to do. But if you preach at someone, that'll scare someone away. So you don't want to do that. But the reason I did want to talk about Acts 18, and I know we have been talking about Acts 18 a lot, but the only reason we talked about it really this time is because I wanted you to get it out of it. That they weren't mean to each other. They didn't disrespect each other. Even if they didn't like each other. Which they probably didn't. But they, there's a chance they couldn't like each other. But there was a chance they could. But I want to encourage y'all. Whether you like someone. Or whether you don't like someone. You should still give them the respect they deserve. So I want y'all to try doing that all throughout your day. So, we're going to go over some animations that are going to tell you exactly what I just said. So, pay attention to these animations, please. This one is about respect. And I got them off of YouTube. There were some children who treated other people disrespectfully, including their parents and especially those that were much older. They felt these people had already lived too long, and they should be sent away. When the children talked with the older people, they made fun of them and said they were dummies and slow. One day, the children found a talking pearl that talked and talked, but they only had time to listen to themselves. The pearl tried and tried to tell them something but they threw the pearl and broke it into many pieces. The pieces went through a tunnel and the children followed them. that the children broke and miraculously the pearl came back together as Gui put the pearl in the children's hands she told them that only superheroes could listen to what the pearl had to say nobody knew what the pearl said to the children however from that day the children discovered that older people are like everybody else and they are very valuable they started sharing unforgettable moments with other people, including their parents. Soon they realized how important it is to talk with others and listen to them. The children stopped thinking of older people they knew as dummies and became their friends. The older people showed the children the beauty and peace that allowed them to enjoy a flower or a sunset. Okay, so I stopped it right there because I wanted to ask y'all a question. And it's not like we're going to watch these whole videos. So, 
I'll stop it when I'm wanting to, um, after the part that I really wanted y'all to see is done. But what I want y'all to write down in your notebook is that when you're kind to someone, it really does make a difference in the world. It really does. Whether you like the person or not, it makes a difference. But we all need to learn to care for one another because just because someone's younger than you doesn't mean anything by it. Just because someone's older than you doesn't mean anything. You can still love them. And we've got to love them like a Christian would. Because most of us Christians, most people in general, actually, don't like to think of others as we need to be loving to. But really, we do. God loved us, and we did nothing to deserve it. Jesus died on the cross to show how much he loved us, but we didn't deserve it. But he was still kind to those he didn't like also. That's one thing we need to take from Jesus is we need to be kind even if we like the person or not. We need to give them that same respect we would want done to us. And in the Bible, it does say, do unto others as you want done unto you. And I really like that verse because you really should do unto others as you want done unto you. Because if you, let's say you don't want something bad done to you, then why do it to someone else? That's my question. And if you want good things done to you, but you treat someone else bad, they won't want to do something good to you. Keep that in mind. Because we all do this. I'm not going to point anyone out. We all do this. Even I do it sometimes. And we just need to be better Christians about that. Now, let's watch the other one. It is how to cope with a boy. A boy in my class bullied me. One time he even hit me. Made me sad, but I forgave him. When I was chosen to lead the class to the lunchroom, I was asked to choose a friend to help me. I picked this boy because others never choose him. I wanted to make him feel good. He thanked me for choosing him. He began to be nice to me. Okay, so what did y'all learn from that? I know I got from it that even if we have a bully, we should still try to be nice to him because there are other ways you can work around it. I mean, just because they're a bully to you doesn't mean that you have to fight back. That's not what, you don't have to. You don't have to do anything. All you have all you should do when someone bullies you is try being nice to them. I want you to write this down right here also. Try being nice to them. If they seem quite lonely sitting all by themselves 
and it can be the biggest bowling you've ever had, anything like that. But I encourage y'all to try to sit down with them and try to do something nice to them. Offer them something, give them something. But you don't always have to offer them and give them something. But I want to encourage y'all to try to make friends with your biggest bully. And I know that's a hard thing to do. I know it is. I had a bully once, but we all need to learn to be friendly to even the people that hurt us the most. Because I know um, whenever someone had used to hurt me, I would be nice to them and treat them like they never even were mean to me, even if they were. So I encourage you to try to be nice to someone, even if they bully you. Don't say, oh, well, I'm not going to hang out with that person. Hang out with them. Give them a try. Be nice to them. Maybe invite them to sit at the lunch table with you. Let's watch another one. After witnessing the violent rage shown by babies whenever deprived of an item they considered their own, Jean Piaget, a founder of child psychology, observed something profound about human nature. Our sense of ownership emerges incredibly early. Why are we so clingy? There's a well-established yeah, so is why are we so attached known as the to our name. effect, where we value items much more highly just as soon as we own them. In one famous demonstration, students were given a choice between a coffee mug or a Swiss chocolate bar as a reward for helping out with research. Half chose the mug and half chose the chocolate. That is, they seemed to value the two rewards similarly. Other students were given a mug first and then a surprise chance to swap it for a chocolate, but only 11% wanted to. Yet another group started out with chocolate and most preferred to keep it rather than swap. In other words, the students nearly always put greater value on whichever reward they started out with. Part of this has to do with how quickly we form connections between our sense of self and the things we consider ours. That can even be seen at the neural level. In one experiment, neuroscientists scanned participants' brains while they allocated various objects either to a basket labeled mine or another labeled Alex's. When participants subsequently looked at their new things, their brains showed more activity in a region that usually flickers into life whenever we think about ourselves. Another reason we're so fond of our possessions is that from a young age, we believe they have a unique essence. Psychologists showed us this by using an illusion to convince three to six-year-olds they built a copying machine a device that could create perfect replicas of any item. When offered a choice between their favorite toy or an apparently exact copy, the majority of the children favored the original. In fact, they were often horrified at the prospect of taking home a copy. This magical thinking about objects isn't something we grow out of. Rather, it persists into adulthood while becoming ever more elaborate. For example, consider the huge value placed on items that have been owned by celebrities. It's as if the buyers believed the objects they purchased were somehow imbued with the essence of their former celebrity owners. For similar reasons, many of us are reluctant to part with family heirlooms, which help us feel connected to lost loved ones. These beliefs can even alter our perception of the physical world and change our athletic abilities. Participants in a recent study were told they were using a golf putter once owned by the champion Ben Curtis. During the experiment, they perceived the hole as being about a centimeter larger than control participants using a standard putter, and they sank slightly more putts. Although feelings of ownership emerge early in life, culture also plays a part. For example, it was recently discovered that Hadza people of northern Tanzania, who are isolated from modern culture, don't exhibit the endowment effect. That's possibly because they live in an egalitarian society where almost everything is shared. At the other extreme, sometimes our attachment to our things can go too far. 
Part of the cause of hoarding disorder is an exaggerated sense of responsibility and protectiveness toward one's belongings. That's why people with this condition find it so difficult to throw anything away. What remains to be seen today is how the nature of our relationship with our possessions will change with the rise of digital technologies. Many have forecast the demise of physical books and music, but for now at least, this seems premature. Perhaps there will always be something uniquely satisfying about holding an object in our hands and calling it our own. So why do y'all think I chose that video? I know why I chose it. I'll give you a few minutes to write down why you think I chose that video. Okay, so I gave you a minute to write down what you thought, why you think I chose that video. The reason why I actually chose that video was because <clears throat> the one thing we should be attached to is our relationship with God. But we automatically have this obsession to our things. Like, it's like, when first, when we get it, we think we own it. And we don't want to share it. But, you know what we should be like that, too? Our relationship with God should be like something you don't want to ever let go of. It should be something you want to have forever. It should be something you want to write your name on and say, I own this. It should be all of those things, but we like to think of stuff more as that. When it's not that, stuff, let me just be 100% honest with y'all right here, right now. Stuff won't always be in there, but you know what will always be in there? God. But yet, we get attached to our stuff instead of attached to God. But God will always be in there. He was there before earth was ever made. He'll be there after earth is done. Stuff will be here when there is earth and stuff will not be here when there is no earth. So the fact that we take possession of our things just is crazy. We shouldn't start taking possession over God, over our relationship with him. Because, I mean, his relationship, our relationship with him is more important than anything you could ever have. And... That is one thing we should love, is our relationship with him, because it doesn't matter right, about things. So, bye.